Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dave Gottwald, Assistant Professor of Art and Design here at the University of Idaho. I'm joining you today as a member of the Bora Foundation Committee. So welcome to the start of this week's symposium events. Thank you for being here. 2021 marks 83 years since the first Bora Foundation sponsored program, which featured an address by then First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. It also marks the 74th consecutive annual Bora Symposium, dating from 1948's event titled, The Causes of War and the Conditions of Peace. The Bora Foundation Committee wishes to sincerely thank Vice President Christopher Tina Mora and the Martin Institute and the Program in International Studies for their support of this year's symposium, as well as Bill L. Smith, the foundation's director. So just a note on what's ahead. After today's panel, we have a virtual talk tomorrow at 1230, Social Change and the 14th Century Plague Pandemic by Scott Minich, professor here at U of I. So pre-registration for that is required. Go to uidaho.edu slash Bora. That's the only URL you need to remember. uidaho.edu slash Bora for that link to pre-register. And then we have our keynote address, which is Wednesday night at 7 p.m. in person at the International Ballroom at the Pittman Center. There, Michael Osterholm, COVID-19 expert and director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, will deliver community health and economic prosperity. And you can also join the keynote virtually at U of I Live. So just a reminder again, for all symposium information and these virtual links, please visit uidaho.edu slash Bora. It's the only one you need to remember. So before I introduce our panel moderator, uh, I'd like to mention how we came to find him. So each of us on the committee were tasked with tracking down awesome, appropriate speakers for the theme of this year's symposium. So we had a brainstorming session around the topic of pandemics. And from that, a number of words emerged. And one of those was resilience. So, you know, we all went off and Googled. Um, I started looking, you know, who had written or spoken about resilience in the context of public health. And a name that kept showing up over and over again was Jean-Manuel Andrea. So Jean-Manuel was on the front lines of the HIV AIDS pandemic while working on a master's degree in journalism at Northwestern University in 1986. He's been a health and medical journalist ever since. In 1999, he published Victory Deferred, a chronicle of those times and struggles. The Smithsonian's National Museum of American History curates a special collection of interviews and documentation that he used to develop the project for the University of Chicago Press. And just this year, Jean-Manuel assumed the role of senior writer for the Winship Cancer Institute at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Please join me in welcoming John Manuel as our panel moderator today. Well, thank you, Dave, and good afternoon to everyone who's joining us. Uh, good evening, actually, from here in Atlanta. We're three hours ahead of you, so it's a little later here than it is there in Idaho. But thank you so much for joining us for this really, what I think is gonna be a really interesting panel discussion. What I'd like to do to start is to introduce our three distinguished panelists um, with uh, little biographical sketches that each of them provided. Um, thank you. And that will give you a sense of who they are and what uh, perspective they bring to our discussion today. Okay, Dr. Isaiah, also known as Ike Wilson III, is a former US Army Colonel, retired. He currently serves as president of the Joint Special Operations University, a decorated combat veteran and full professor of political science. Dr. Wilson is a nationally and internationally recognized leading advocate for change in how America understands and deals with matters of security affairs and uses of force in times of peace and war at a time when disruptive change continues to outpace organizations and organizational leadership ability to think and act fast and effectively. Just below me, I don't know if the, the Zoom uh, order has us in the order that I'm seeing, but just below me on the Zoom screen is Jenny Ottenhoff. Uh, Jenny is a senior policy director at the One Campaign, where she leads the organization's work on ending preventable infectious diseases like HIV AIDS and COVID-19. 
Jenny's work focuses on securing financing for major international institutions and strengthening donor policies to advance global health objectives. Finally, we have Dr. Jamie Atten. Jamie is the Blanchard Chair of Humanitarian and Disaster Leadership and the founder and co-director of the Humanitarian Disaster Institute at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Atten is frequently cited or interviewed in media outlets, such as the Washington Post, USA Today, and CBS. He has also written widely in outlets like Time, Psychology Today, and Christianity Today. Atten has received the American Psychological Association Early Career Award and the 2016 FEMA Community Preparedness Champion Award at the White House. So as, as I promised, we have a distinguished panel of speakers to uh, discuss the subject pandemics and going back to what uh, Dave Gottwald described as the, the very first uh, Boris Symposium lecture by First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt back in 1948, causes of war and conditions of peace and applying those that frame to the discussion of pandemics. Okay, my background, as you've heard, is largely HIV AIDS, when I first started writing about 35 years ago. Uh, that was my sort of lens through which I learned a lot about health and medicine. It's also, also the lens through which I've experienced the COVID-19 pandemic. But we're interested in hearing from our panelists and the unique perspective that they each bring. And, and it sort of um, gives us a, a well-rounded uh, take on our subject. I think I, I'd first like to hear from Jenny Ottenhoff because the COVID-19 pandemic has been nothing if not a, a pandemic of disparities and social justice is an issue that has been raised to the fore because of the, those disparities as to who is most heavily affected, who has access to resources, including vaccines. Uh, and so I would love to hear uh, Jenny's opening comments and then a, a response to that question. Sure, thank you so you much. Yeah. So. I'm going to start off by kind of stating the obvious. The global response to COVID-19 is not working. Um, we're all living through this crisis, so that probably doesn't feel like a super insightful comment. But um, here's what I mean by that. We have the tools to end the pandemic. There are a number of highly effective vaccines available, um, more on the way. So we could end this as a public health threat. And, and you know, it might become endemic, but we can live with that. Um, and we'll be taking lives and, and stopping our livelihoods the way we've seen it do in the last year. But to date, under 5% of the doses administered of vaccines globally have gone to people in low-income countries. And if we zoom out a little bit more and look at lower middle-income countries, we're looking at the world's poorest countries. This is home to over half of the world's population and under 20% of vaccines administered to date have gone to people in those countries. And if we break that down by region, Africa is being left way behind people in Africa. So this is what I mean when I say the response to COVID-19 isn't working because if it's not working, for the world's poorest countries. It's not working for Africa. And as long as it's not working for these populous parts of the world, it's not working for anyone because the longer we allow this virus to circulate unchecked anywhere on the planet, uh, it's going to continue to mutate. We're at risk of variants that are more contagious, more deadly, eventually more resistant to the tools we have. So we really need to get ahead of this and stop this everywhere on earth so that we can kind of get back to life. Um, how did we land here? I'll take a second to explain that, or at least top lines. Um, there are a lot of reasons. I hope we can unpack more of those here, but I'm going to boil it down to just kind of three top line things. First, vac vaccine nationalism really won the day. Rich countries purchased the majority of vaccines available, um, have contracts for vaccines that haven't even yet been made, and there's just not any left for poorer countries to buy, even though they're bringing money to the table. Um, this is not necessarily a problem of kind of charity, um, that the systems did not work. Um, supply chains broke down. Vaccines are manufactured largely um, in the US and Western Europe and, and to some degree in India. 
And even though they're manufactured by independent con con companies, um, they still can be impacted by country policies. And for instance, we saw an export ban in India that presented, uh, prevented um, the Serum Institute of India from exporting a number or any of their vaccines. And most of those vaccines were going to low-income countries. So that's one of the reasons we haven't seen vaccination scaling up in low-income countries for the last six months. Um, finally, the world wasn't prepared. And uh, Jean-Manuel, you, you were, we should, we should have been, we've seen this happen before. I've worked on AIDS for most of my career as well. Um, anyone working on public health knows that a pandemic is right around the corner and we will see more pandemic threats if not full-blown pandemics in our lifetime, I'm certain of it. So why weren't we prepared? And the, the institutions we have and the, and the kind of political structures we have, we're not able to adapt and really take a collective approach to addressing the pandemic. So what we need moving forward is a more collective, globalized approach to doing this, more equity built into that. And it doesn't have to come at the expense of, of any one country. Um, we need more leadership right now to get over this hump. Um, and that leadership really needs to come from rich countries. We started to see steps towards us in the last few weeks from the Biden administration and hope to see more from other countries in the coming months. We need a lot of funding to get doses delivered and into arms in low-income countries because delivery is going to become more of a barrier once supply opens up. And then the longer term solution is manufacturing more globally. We need more manufacturing hubs in regional institutions, as well as a politics so that we don't see people blocking the way in the future. So that's my quick overview um, and happy to unpack more of that. Dr. Wilson, I, I'd love to hear um, your opening statement. And also as, as a military expert, strategy expert, very interested in hearing your take on the parallels between addressing a pandemic and fighting a war and the, the components of fighting a war that are uh, transferable to um, fighting a pandemic. Thanks, John Manuel. And I'm, I'm so glad that at me as the former military guy, uh, you, you did not uh, pick me to go first in the order. I usually like going last uh, in the order of, uh, of March, if you will, um, to make the point that all anything related to the military should be a last resort and should always follow and support development and diplomatic efforts. So I'm very happy to be following uh, Jenny. Um, John Manuel, I'll try to get to, to your questions. I've got a little bit of an opening statement. Um, I'll at least in the opening um, try to provo provoke uh, and uh, some ideas and, and maybe have an opportunity through the, the Q&A and the back and forth among the panelists to um, unpack some of the of the parallels uh, between how we prepare or fail to prepare or under prepare um, for our traditional wars and in the in the curious uh, eerie and tragic similarities uh, to uh, some of the shortfalls in terms of how we've underprepared for this global pandemic. So uh, just some quick thoughts opening up. Uh, I would say true to and echoing the, echoing the spirit captured in the subtitle of our panel's theme, uh, which is looking back, facing forward. Uh, I've been doing a lot of looking back while facing forward of late, uh, along with a lot of my co former comrades in arms uh, in the military, trying to see a point and purpose, or as the great Clausewitz, uh, Carl von Clausewitz uh, might uh, have said or put it, to see a relative peace as we might come to know it uh, to the two decades running twin wars of Afghanistan and Iraq and so many others in between that were born out of the ashes of the Twin Towers in the wake of the attacks of 9-11. Uh, as a soldier scholar, these have been my wars and like the last of the three major wars of my own father during his, uh, his time in uniform, uh, they have clearly fallen far short of the relative pieces we originally sought or at least hopefully intended at their beginnings. Uh, there's no reason to expect anything better in terms of better outcomes as we face forward, unless we are finally willing and able to take a deliberate action to not just think anew, but commit to doing new and in wholly new ways. To put a, a point on it, uh, we're living at and facing the challenges of a time when disruptive change, once again, continues to outpace organizations and organizational leadership in its ability to think and act fast and effectively. Now, back in May of 2020, I wrote a special commentary uh, titled Whole of Government without the H or without the W in front of the whole, Whole of Government, H-O-L-E, what COVID-19 reveals about American uh, security planning. 
I think this is the piece that the student faculty planners for this year's symposium uh, unearthed that got me invited to speak with you all today. So uh, at least I got some uh, positives out of that at that, that short essay uh, last year. The message I intended then is still uh, what I intend today. While we tout whole of governments, W-H-O-L-E, whole of governments and whole of solutions, society solutions, we suffer holes, H-O-L-E-S in our government and our governmental and non-governmental ways of seeing and approaching problems and puzzles in integrative ways that promise better chances of becoming sustainable security solutions. I'd like to, to begin to end my, my opener with uh, just reading a quick excerpt from the intro of that uh, 20 May, uh, uh, 2020 May essay, and I'll, I'll quote uh, from, from it at this point. The coronavirus or COVID-19 typifies the compound nature of today's security threats. This deadly adversary is, inip is inip inimical to accepted international laws and conventions regarding warfare and human security protections. It is a true omnivore, respecting no borders and consuming all classes, genders, races, and faiths. This adversary has driven mass societal disruption and managed in about four months at the time to infect over 1. million confirmed cases with nearly 72,000 deaths. Again, this is May of 2020, and that's in the United States alone. Worldwide economic recession, even depression, seems likely, and national publics now question their government's capacity as well as their will to contain the adversary. Should governments fail to do so, and most experts agree that the opportunity to contain COVID-19 is lost, big data computer projections predict as many as 173,000 could die in the United States alone by the end of May 2020. The yet untold damage of such a toll across all sectors, political, economic, and societal is incalculable. The potential for a global paradigm shift in the way we should perceive these threats is real. Now, some may ask why speak of combating a global pandemic as though we are waging an apocalypse war. This moment takes the popular vert fashion of war rhetoric beyond the metaphorical. We are at war against this virus, or at least we should be. We should regard this threat and its compounded implications as a security issue it is. COVID-19 is indicative of the changed nature of many of today's threats. That's an end quote. Now, I, I considered updating the casualty figures to, to present date, but I ultimately chose not to. Because those originally grossly undercalculated extreme end projections at the time, now in 18-month hindsight, reveals one of the most perilous governing dynamics of this thing I refer to and that I call compound security. That being the multiplicative contagion character of these compound security threats of which a global uh, biological pandemic, health pandemic is uh, the most uh, tragic exemplar of. I would say this, I would end by saying, or begin to end by saying, this is one of the most interesting and dangerous periods in, in the history of the world system. What makes the period uniquely dangerous is the nature of the threats. The threats that we face today are incredibly complex and multidimensional as well as multiplicative and even exponential in their effects. They're what we call compound threats. And many of these threats are impossible to contain because of their transnational and transregional nature. The key to understanding and coping with such compound security dilemmas is captured well in the supreme judgment offered by, again, that 19th century dead Prussian military leader and thinker, Karl von Clausewitz, when he said, first, before all other things, determine the kind of war you are embarked upon. We policymakers, shapers, pundits alike, we so love to make use of reference of war and warfare and war fighting in our policy endeavors for lots of reasons, not the least of which the imperatives and the gravitas of the war language and the war rhetoric and of doing so. And so it has been as well, the reference to the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic as a war and the lateness of our national leadership to prepare and place the country on proper war fitting. I could as much be talking about the COVID-19 pandemic in that lateness, that too little, too late for not long enough um, investment, and even the seeing of the threat as the war span, as the world spanning threat that it was and that it is. I could easily be talking about a global pandemic like COVID-19 as I could be in the immediate wake of 20 years of investment in the war in Afghanistan with and left with uh, uh, at least 
to to say a uh, a major question on um, to what end towards what end uh, question mark right. Um, this virus is nothing more, but I would say also nothing less, and this is just to provoke. I would say it's nothing less than a globalizing insurgency, threatening the stability, health, figuratively and literally in this sense, when we're talking about a global pandemic, as well as the legitimacy of the so-called Westphalian liberal-based international order in the sense of democracies particularly, but world system more generally, their ability and their willingness to solve societal problems. And as such, what is needed is nothing less than a whole of governments, plural, not singular, and whole of societies, population-centric approach to countering all kinds of insurgencies or threats to the legitimate authority of governing um, systems that, you know, by, with, and for the societies that uh, give them power. We require some, nothing less than a population-centric coin strategy and campaign approach for overmatching the threat and the compound risks risk of, com of, of all compound threats in compound conflicts to include COVID-19. I'll pause there. Hopefully that's enough to provoke some great questions and pushback during uh, today's session. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Dr. Atten, um, as an expert in humanitarian disaster response and relief, um, I'm sure you'll agree that COVID-19 is nothing if not a massive humanitarian disaster. Um, and I'm interested, and of course, hearing your opening statement, your opening comments, but also hearing you address the, the idea of framing the pandemic as a humanitarian disaster. And what from your backgrounds in that field um, do you see as relevant to addressing the pandemic? So, Thank you so much. your opening comments and then a question. Yeah, thanks for the great questions there. And so I'll, I'll kind of combine both together here. And the, the way I first got involved in this work was right after I finished my uh, graduate training as a psychologist, I had moved to South Mississippi and then six days later, Hurricane Katrina struck our community. So I had gone to study rural uh, health disparities in Mississippi, but then found myself within weeks after Katrina of doing similar types of research, but specifically on resilience amidst Katrina, and then also learning from my own experience as well as launching a number of research studies. So that was my welcome to Mississippi. And then five years later, as I was getting ready to transition and move to the Chicago area, the week that I was moving was the deep water or deep horizon oil spill that had occurred. And so kind of had those as my bookend experiences. And then in between that was doing a number of different studies and trainings and working with communities impacted by both the natural disasters, but also uh, mass traumas like in the DRC or Democratic Republic of Congo and working with gender-based trauma survivors there and also other international disasters. And then over the last 15 years, I continued to study these things. Um, and then I had my own personal disaster. Uh, it would be actually eight years ago, um, almost to the day when I was diagnosed with stage four cancer at the age of 35. So um, in that account, I was then seeing some of the things that I'd spent my career studying around the globe playing out in my own personal life. And so all of those things have impacted the way that I've thought about and approached COVID-19. One of the things that was also really influential for me was that, you know, I oftentimes as a person who um, sits around and thinks about these worst case scenarios all day, I often get asked, what is the disaster that keeps you up at night? And for me, it's always been a public health crisis. And part of the reason for that was a number of years ago, our institute had a contract through CDC to specifically try to understand and help equip um, diverse uh, houses of worship for public health crises. And it was just really eye-opening to me at that point about just how unprepared we really were or what the kind of working knowledge the average individual had, including my own, uh, about um, pandemics. And it was really eye-opening. And then we also had done a few research studies around the Ebola outbreak. So one studying humanitarians that were actually in the field responding, but also trying to understand what was happening and like why were some people um, coping with such high levels of anxiety and maybe even bias or prejudice against certain groups um, in the U.S. when we had the very first cases diagnosed. So we were trying to get the heart of that 
as well in some of our studies. And so it's led me to think about the pandemic in a couple of ways. One, if you look at disasters, um, you may have seen there's these really nice charts that uh, often get used that kind of talk about the different phases of disaster, where you've got the impact moving towards kind of this honeymoon phase of we're going to pull together, we're all going to come through this together. And then you have where the reality starts to set in, where people realize that, you know, this recovery is going to be a lot longer and more difficult than what we had anticipated and then moving on out to the recovery phase. And um, I, I found that to be a, a helpful model for understanding what was occurring. But one of the things that's so unique about COVID-19 is that you would have to kind of take that model and stretch it out indefinitely to really understand the pandemic. You know, one of the things I, I felt often like I was the person that nobody wanted to talk to at the beginning of the pandemic because I kept being the one of saying, we really need to be thinking about this for the long term, you know, that I was kind of the Debbie Downer of every conversation that I was in for a while. Um, but the reason why I was making those statements was having worked in other disasters, knowing that, you know, my own experience from Katrina, that as soon as that passed over my community in the matter of an hour or so, that we were survivors and that we then had this long haul uh, of recovery. But COVID-19 has been like having a giant hurricane hovering over the globe now for getting close to two years. So we're not even past the actual full-blown crisis aspect of this. And so we need to recognize that this is going to be a long process. And then as you look at in some ways kind of comparing it, I think that COVID-19 is more similar to a technical disaster than a natural disaster. So, you know, I mentioned those kind of two book and experiences that, you know, after Hurricane Katrina, you saw those immediate spikes in mental health struggles. You know, we saw some spikes in suicide ideation, you know, anxiety and depression. And then it started to level off as time went on. Um, but now with COVID-19, or in the case I mentioned of the um, oil spill, that even though there was a little bit of a spike in some anxieties, that you really didn't see the negative impact until we started feeling the full brunt of the economic uh, struggles that people were going to occur. And over time, that those mental health symptoms actually got worse rather than better. And I think that we're seeing a very similar parallel playing out right now with COVID-19 and those additional problems. You know, one of the other things in disasters that I've seen, for example, in Japan is that very few disasters are the only problem at hand. So, you know, I mentioned about being a cancer survivor that, well, when something, you know, with COVID-19, then I also had to be thinking about what are some of those extra precautions that I would have to take as someone who's had a history of cancer and that, you know, this event isn't occurring in a vacuum. And that in certain disasters, we often talk about complex emergencies, where one disaster triggers another disaster. So like, for instance, when our team was helping in Japan after the uh, 311 tsunami, it was actually, you know, hundreds of small earthquakes that led to a major earthquake that then created the seismic shift, which then led to the tsunami. And then the tsunami led to the meltdown of the nuclear plant, which then contaminated water. And then, and so you just see this kind of, um, uh, cascading effect. And I think that that's what we're seeing here um, with COVID-19 and something that we're going to continue to see those waves continue to play out, especially when you, you know, hear some of the stats like what Jenny was talking about, that if we're not addressing these bigger systemic issues, then these problems are going to continue to cascade. I, I was really interested in what you said about being the Debbie Downer, you know, as far as uh, forecasting that this pandemic wasn't just going to be a short-lived thing, um, but that it was going to uh, take much longer than we expected, and that, in fact, the virus will be with us forever in one form or another. I remember exactly those discussions about HIV AIDS back in the 80s, and people who said, better get used to this being a lifelong thing. This is going to be with us, you know, our whole lives. Those people were roundly criticized for being so negative. Um, but in fact, now this year, as we mark 40 years of the HIV pandemic, um, they were actually quite prophetic. <laughs> um, Jenny, I'm interested uh, again in um, parallels from your background uh, with HIV AIDS, you know, similar to my own, and the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of Within this country, who has been 
affected and disproportionately affected these disparities you know, that we talk about. I, I have an article right here from the Los Angeles Times, COVID racial disparities extend to hospitalizations, uh, black LA residents rate higher than Latinos and whites. You know, black Americans have been devastated by the COVID-19 pandemic. What from your background in HIV AIDS, uh, as far as addressing pandemic, uh, uh, sorry, disparities in a public health uh, crisis, what, what do you see as relevant to helping us um, address the disparities in this country with COVID? Yeah, I mean, the disparities are stark and my experience is mostly global, but there's parallels here. And I think you know, the disparities in, in communities of color in America or, or you know, lower income countries or whatever it looks like, it doesn't, it extends well beyond COVID-19. Um, you know, it, it goes to child, like um, maternal mortality, like things that we think are kind of over in the United States and they're not, if you look at uh, particularly um, populations of color. So really what we're seeing is a breakdown of our healthcare system under a microscope. Um, and it's not just healthcare. I mean, it, it's, it's access to healthcare. It's trust of the healthcare system. It is uh, access to information and access to information um, that is um, accurate and coming from trusted sources. And it's out there, but um, it's also, I mean, this extrapolates well out to um, look at the look at who can access healthcare easily. Um, and with COVID-19, it's extraordinarily difficult if you are trying to hold down a job, if you have children, I mean, it, it, it's hard to go to the grocery store, let alone carve out time to go see a doctor, see a doctor kind of in a timely manner. And even if you go, there's risks associated with that or mistrust associated with that. So these are the kinds of challenges we see in the United States all the time, be it COVID-19 or otherwise. And we're just, it's under a microscope right now. So I think my hope is that, um, you know, as we, as we march towards greater equity and healthcare access, this is, this is one more kind of step in, the, in that direction um, and lessons learned that I'm, I'm hoping we can really take those lessons learned and start applying the types of um, systemic change that needs to happen to make sure that all communities are reached with the, with the type of healthcare and the type of information that they need. Um, similar in other countries. Um, but I think, you know, when we're, if you're zooming out to the inequities globally, it's kind of on this macro scale where um, people who have information and do have access to healthcare just simply have, there's no vaccines to go around um, or no oxygen to go around or no PPE to go around. So, I mean, it, it's kind of um, the systems break down all the way up um, and globally. And I think that's really the challenge before us when we start looking at the future. I mean, we're gonna muddle through it. There are some kind of band-aids that have been put in place in the international system. There is some new political momentum. We hope get some of these things over the line. So in 2022, I'm hopeful that is pending any crazy new variant that we have the pieces in place to vaccinate more and more and more people such that we stop another massive surge. But I mean, I'm not, I don't, I'm, it's too soon to say I'm optimistic, but I'm hopeful. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think when we're looking to the future and there's already conversations about pandemic preparedness and how do we prevent this? I mean, I think Dr. Wilson hit the nail on the head. We need to be treating global health like a national security or an economic security issue. Economics and national security always get top bill when it comes to how we fund in the government, how, uh, what gets political priority, what's a good stump speech um, in, in elections. Global health never features um, on any of those. And it's really looked at as a charity thing. It's not looked at as a national security thing. And, and I'm, I, I, I really do try to be an optimist, but I, I am worried that we're gonna see momentum for a year or two, and then we have short memories and it doesn't fit into the political narrative that works for people and it falls off. So that's what we really, really have to fight. Um, and we have to figure out how to make sure that this is prioritized year over year, even when we don't, when we're not seeing a crisis. We need to celebrate the fact that there isn't a crisis and we need to continue investing in the systems to make sure it doesn't happen again. Dr. Wilson, that, that segues perfectly to, uh, to you and uh, a question for you of here we are a year and a half plus into the COVID pandemic um, and your concept of an all of government, all of society response is the horse 
too far out of the gate at this point? Um, or is it possible to kind of retrofit our response um, in a way that, that does view uh, COVID-19 or any subsequent public health crises as the threats to national security that they, that they really are? Yeah, this, you know, talking, I think, I think uh, Jamie said it first about the Debbie Downer. I mean, I, you know, I think we're all going to get the prize here. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to dig us out of this Debbie Downer hole um, with the comment, um, comments I'm about to put on the table here. Um, a, a few thoughts, um, uh, John Manuel. Uh, first, I mean, specific to the COVID-19 um, pandemic, I mean, we like reflect back uh, two years ago. Uh, Two years ago, the horse was already out of the bore and unbridled. Uh, we, we, we failed, we, we missed the opportunity to contain. And frankly, we probably missed the opportunity to contain this threat. And I'm gonna use some military language for the, because the parallels are, are quite eerie and stark and, and troublesome. Um, we, fa we failed a decade ago to set the right types of conditions to get at the root causes and from a preparedness standpoint, to get in front of the response, mitigate and recover structured cycle of our emergency management system writ large, whether you're talking about domestic emergency management or um, uh, war footing, you know, military campaigning, mil approaches to military operations. Uh, we failed to we failed to contain because we failed to really pre prepare. Uh, and why is that? Because our system is structured largely in a way that uh, it, there are lots of us, probably all of us on this panel, were at those times, so 10, 10 years ago, um, Debbie as Debbie Downer then as we are now, um, making the clarion call for the kinds of investments that are never, to Jenny's point, uh, that are never gonna muster in light of, um, in sh short of a crisis, in a traditional sense in your face crisis moment, uh, because it has to compete with what we've made the traditional top priority issues. And you know, I represent or once you know, represented the uniformed services, which is the proverbial 900 pound gorilla in the room that beats everybody in the budget, in the budget grapples, in the budget wrestling matches, right? Um, well, the reasons why, if I look for a positive angle of utilizing the war rhetoric and the approach to national security and defense crises, and to try to superimpose that onto issues of root causal human security concerns, uh, to try to almost trick ourselves and trick the system uh, to where we can actually, in casting these issues in this context, maybe we can, maybe we can actually leverage some of the worst parts of us that nothing gets invested in until it's at crisis moment or frankly, after the crisis shock has already occurred. And then we play the perfect catch up game. Uh, and typically it's, it's, the, it's the uniform members. We got to treat it like a war because of lots of factors, right? We don't have enough time in this, in this panel, in this seminar to actually talk about those cases. But I'll, it, it's almost trying to trick ourselves to get the system to use the frame that denies us the prevention and the focus on human security concerns because of the over dominance of militarization of all things and try to take advantage of this moment right now. Um, and I, I, I try to get the military to do the same thing in terms of public service announcements and, and, and whatnot from you know, you know, embracing vaccination, uh, but to, to change our footing and our approach to consider for the moment while the window's open, while the crisis is driving us and try to advantage that small window of opportunity that will come slamming close as soon as we think that we've reached a quote unquote mission accomplished um, point, which if the last 20 years of our real wars have shown anything, the minute we say mission accomplished is usually the beginning of the thing, uh, when we're already ready and calling ourselves exhausted and we really haven't even gotten to the line of departure for the, for the real war towards a sustainable security peace as we can come to know it. Uh, and that might be 10, 20 years off, right? So these are, these are long campaigns, these are long wars. Uh, hopefully that got to, to, some, to some of your question. It's, it's, uh, there, there's a lot against this. It's, there's a flaw by design, by institutional organizational design. It's, there's a flaw in 
in terms of how of what we consider a security affair and within the jurisdictional boundaries and therefore top of the list for investment and and what falls shy of that unfortunately the human the human issues top of the list public health security by design and by organizational culture that lives within those designs falls um, far too low on 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 the uh, on the packing packing order in terms of investments it takes a shock to elevate it we can't take credit for for preparedness we are perfect reactors to crises and some might say myself included that our system is structured to where if you don't have a real shock and the real loss of a first battle of the next war you almost have to concoct it in order to get our system to to trigger in in new innovative ways of of getting at the essence of why we do all of what we do as public servants, which is the human factor. I'll pause there. That's a lot of, uh, there's a lot on the table. Hopefully there's a little bit in my circuitous route to, to those offerings that, that help us out here. Actually, um, your comments just offered me a good segue to Dr. Atten. <laughs> so it's, it's going well. Um, Jamie, in your opening comments, you talked about the the sort of four stages of a disaster, the impact, the honeymoon stage where there's a sense of solidarity and folks kind of working together. And then the reality of, of recovery that it's not happening as quickly as we might like. And then there's the recovery itself. Where do you see the United States right now in terms of um, our response to this disaster? You know, um, we seem to have missed the initial impact it's been kind of a, a, a slow, uh, slowly exploding bomb really in the culture, going from first affecting older folks in nursing homes and providing anyone who wanted one an opportunity to say, well, this isn't relevant to me uh, until finally it became relevant. So where do you see us at, at this point in this public health disaster? You know, I, I think that in many ways across the U.S. and globally that we see that uh, the response doesn't quite fit perfectly on our are on that sort of table, right? That we would love for everything to fit nice and neat in a linear fashion, when in reality, most disasters do unfold where there's some circularness to it. Um, and when we overlay it, though, with COVID-19, I think more broadly in the U.S., we're at that disillusionment phase. But then there are other, you know, like I think about, you know, tracking the own, my own stats, you know, of what's going on in the, you know, nearest to me in my own community and county and state, and then thinking about what's happening in different regions, what's happening, you know, in different countries, that you do see people at different phases. And one of the things that we know is that those that were underserved um, prior to uh, a disaster that they're going to be the ones that struggle the most and the longest. And so I think that you definitely see that um, happening now with COVID-19, that in many ways what we've seen is put a spotlight on injustices that already existed and now have been made worse. But I think broadly right now, the U.S. is kind of in this disillusionment phase. And I had hoped that we would be in the early phases of recovery by this point. But the fact that we still have large swaths of um, individuals not getting vaccinated, that you know, there's a lot of uproar about certain social distancing types of policies or masking, that until we all start to really make changes in our behaviors, that the current phase that we're in is going to continue to um, uh, continue to extend and be, continue to be a challenge for us. Well, okay, so here's, here's a general question and I'll just invite uh, whoever wants to address it to, to kind of jump in. And um, I see your, your squared light up. It's kind of like, um, I, I don't know, Jeopardy or something. <laughs> um, <clears throat> how, from your point of view and your frame, your professional lens, um, what do you think is, uh, this are the steps that we need as a country uh, to take to move this forward, to move toward the recovery stage. 
Um, I mean, it, it's more justice, it's more equity, access, um, it's strategy. It's also an understanding of uh, the devastation that, that we have experienced as, as people. Um, how do we support the resilience of an entire country? I mean, really, um, is it public messaging, education? Uh, get the message out? Um, what do we need? It seems like a little of what each of you brings to it, um, but I'm interested in your take. Maybe I'll maybe I'll take the first stab. I, sure. I, I got the quick buzzer on the Jeopardy on the Jeopardy round. Um, I may regret it. Um, I would, you know, John Jan, John Manuel. I would say all the above. Right. It's a bit of a cheat of an answer, but honestly, it is the truth uh, in exponential ways. I mean, this whole idea that I that I teased out in a lot of my research. Um, of the compound of this idea of a compound security dynamic, I call it the compound security dilemma. Um, what what that gets at is what I mean by compounded is the 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 intersectionality of of challenges and threats. I would say the collision of once what once may have been more easily separate, inseparable um, policy whether it's public or private policy issues and sectors, uh, we nice, nice fitting divisions of the foreign and domestic just to begin there, the military, non-military, the security, non-security, defense, non-defense, public, private, uh, consistent largely from the United States um, standpoint in particular um, of shared power through separate institutionalization, right? So there's some, some elements of our system that actually perpetuate this for constitutional reasons, big C and small C, but that perpetuates and exacerbates the say do gaps between a system of governance that is structured for keeping these threats separate and divided, and as such, to keep them contained, right? So you can retain a command and control ability over the threats, keep them separate, discrete, and low boil. But under these compounding dynamics, um, contagion, right? It's really war as contagion. All these factors spilling over our preferred institutional separations and our stovepipes. Um, and the, the metastasis of the threat lies in between, in the spaces in between. So we approach these problems as separate, discrete problems, but they are intersectional. And then you start getting these perverse paradoxes that come out of this compound security dilemma, uh, where you continue to put more force, you dedicate more investment in the same ways that we've always done. The public health sector does their thing. The development folks do their thing. The military folks do their thing. We're separate and divided. And here's the sinister perverse aspect of it. The more you apply the same types of force, even doubling, tripling down, in the same traditional ways, it's the wicked problem dynamic. You not only don't solve, but you accelerate the metastasis, right? You accelerate the dilemma. You make, you make the disease angry in an exponential sense. And then you sit back as a, of a, as a, a governance body, as part of the body politic, growing more and more frustrated and confused as you're piling in more and more force for power purposes, but that force is not getting the power equation to equate. That's what I mean by this by this compound compound dilemma. We're gonna have to. I, I think nothing short of getting at root causes, really really dedicating the time, getting a strategic patience to understand and appreciate at root level, root cause and underlying current and constants level. The human the human security matters, um, and everything that layers upon that say our interests are mat traditional material-based, resource-based, whether it's here in the United States or globally, the only way to get at that in a sustainable and legitimate way is to take on as your own, the human security concerns of the world system. Now that sounds Pollyannish, but I truly believe that the nature and the character, the changed character of global geopolitical competition under these compound dynamics is such that there are no unilateral solutions. You can certainly choose from a policy standpoint to approach these things unilaterally. 
You can start wars to solve, but you can't finish them legitimately. And in fact, the more you, you approach them in a traditional manner, you'll, you'll end up becoming a, an abomination of your original self, right? We'll lose the soul of our, of our nationhoods unless we adjust to the character and the nature of the threats. We are completely structured counter to that. And so um, I wish I could leave us with a bit more of a positive sense. Knowing though, knowing that that may be the case is part of the solution to the problem, right? No, admitting that you have a problem and that it's a problem that transcends unilateral action. There, there is hope in that. And we should take advantage of these crisis moments to exploit the attention that everyone's drawn to because it becomes very personal. Um, that's the other sinister piece of this, right? The, the world system's going to more transactional everything, self-help dynamics. So there's the last paradox of this compound security dilemma, right when all things are compounding and require collective action, the mercantilist beggar thy neighbor dynamics of self-help are driving us all in the opposite direction. That's true from the individual, the household level, all the way to the, to the world system level. I'll pause there, thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Ike. Can I call you Dr. Ike? <laughs> uh, please, I much um, prefer that. Great. So, um, you know, wonderful to, it's discussion that we've had so far. We have about 25 to 30 minutes left for Q&A. So I'd like to invite all the attendees here in the webinar to use the Q&A function. You'll find that button in Zoom. It's down in sort of the lower right area there. Um, it's sort of like a one-way chat. So that will show up to myself and the other hosts. And I'm just gonna read off from those, uh, those that sort of um, look interesting. We've got some popping in right now. So um, I'll ask those of Jean-Manuel in the group and so whoever wants to chime in. So our first question from attendees, isn't the real problem political, both nationally and globally? We lack faith in nationwide and global-wide governmental agencies that would successfully deal with this crisis. So this question sounds like a crisis of faith in institutions. Well, what do we think? I'm happy to jump in on this. <laughs> um, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, and I would say yes, um, to some degree, at least. I, I think, you know, we have a long way to go in being prepared for pandemics in the global health sense, but a lot has been done. Um, we know how health systems need to be strengthened. We know where to put investments. Uh, we know how to do surveillance, like it, more of it's needed, um, but we know. I think the massive blind spot from this pandemic is the politics. Yeah. No one could have anticipated and still can't anticipate how, how the politics will factor into the response. Um, I, I don't have uh, an insightful answer as to what that means other than we have to figure out or at least be more eyes wide open and see how can we build international systems and institutions that are more resilient to the whims of politics, which is extraordinarily difficult, um, but can be done. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges ahead of us. I, the one thing I will say is I, I don't think the solution is throwing out international institutions. Um, I really, there's a, a valuable role they play. And I actually think that even in perfect, even weekend, they act as a counter to some of the kind of the bad politics we see play out either in countries themselves or globally. So I think it's absolutely critical that we continue to invest in and continue to adapt and evolve the international institutions that work on global health and global security. Um, because without those, I do think we'd be heading even further in the wrong direction. And if I could just add to that, you know, I, I think it's so important for us to be able to take this conversation and keep it as a public health conversation and not to allow it to continue as a political divide. Um, one of the things that we've seen studying different types of disasters, we've looked at, do people respond differently to different types of events? So for example, to say a natural disaster versus a terrorist attack versus an oil spill or technical disaster. And one of the things that we know is that when people feel threatened, regardless of the type of event, that we tend to, in some ways, like social psychologists refer to it as in-group, out-group differences as a way to feel protected from threats. So we're going to, you know, so for instance, if you think about Hurricane Katrina after natural disasters in general, we see that things like domestic violence goes up, where the conflict tends to happen between those that you're closest with, but then with external threats where you could actually identify 
you know, who caused this, right? So going back to natural disasters, you know, most of our insurance policies probably call them an act of God, something that's kind of out of our control that you can't reach out and touch, you know, what caused this problem. Um, and so that case being nature, but then with a terrorist attack, you start to see groups where things like biasness, prejudice, you know, um, attacking groups that you perceive as different than your own starts to drastically increase. And, and we see that phenomenon right now that people are feeling frightful and they're circling the wagons, but instead of circling and fighting against the pandemic, we've turned it into a political divide and now are fighting each other. I mean, I've actually had death threats against me for advocating for people to get the vaccine you know so what had been a culture war we are turning that into much more of a liberal war um, against each other even dave can i just quickly um offer a couple of thoughts uh, to both um jenny and uh absolutely q a still means cues from you and then i've got one ready for you excellent, in the excellent. um I, first i want to say i i, I want to i want to triple down on Jenny's um, hope that we don't give up on international organizations. I would say, you know, we need to triple down the investment on international uh, regimes and international organizations for lots of reasons, not the least of which as an extension of national state uh, force and power to, to get that multiplicative approach, context and investment power. Uh, that I'm talking about in order to overmatch, again, this, this idea of, of threats and puzzles compounding. Um, on the politics thing, I couldn't agree more. I mean, at, at, again, at root cause, it's, also, it's always about the politics. I wish we could extract the, the quote unquote politics from these matters, but you know, as, a, as a student and practitioner of war, um, war is a continuation of politics by other abominable means, but it is an act, it is an act of uh, to compel uh, others to a different will than, than their, their original choosing, uh, to kind of paraphrase, uh, not only Klauswitz, but Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu um, and everyone in between. Um, getting after those root causes, I, I think we have to deal with and grapple with the politics at the root level in order to get on the same pace with the threats, whether they're man-made or um, natural and biological. Um, the, the politics have to be dealt with. Case in point, I'll end on this. You know, this the COVID-19 um, enemy, right? Uh, a, a perfect, tragic, sociopathic enemy right? Doesn't care who we are, what our politics are, red, blue, or anything in between. Doesn't care about ide ideology, race, gender, class, ethnicity. Doesn't care about any of that. Um, where's the eight? But there's a lot of agency, as we've already talked about, in terms of the impacts and the consequences of this natural biological threat. We've turned it, we've made it racial. We've made it, um, we've, we've made it a class matter. We've added the agency to a perfectly agnostic, um, non-agent threat. And that's embedded into our cultures, in ourselves, in our politics. And those are embedded in the institutional inequality that, is our, that, it, that are our social uh, and governmental and non-governmental structures. So um, the biggest threat of a threat like COVID-19 may be more ourselves than the natural threat itself. And I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah, I mean, it's not like it's a new problem. It's just another problem that's highlighting all the other problems that were already here. Um, so along those lines, we have a, a comment here in the Q&A. Is vaccine nationalism an old problem or is it just more visible now? with this pandemic? I think it's, uh, it's an ever-present problem. It's, I, um, we saw something similar happen in 2010 with the swine flu. Um, now that did not become the global pandemic like COVID-19 did, but there was a, a kind of run on vaccines by the United States. And actually a lot of them ended up um, expiring and kind of 
going to waste in the US where they could have been used in Asia. And that was a, a big scandal in 2010, at least a scandal among those paying attention in global health. So um, we were hoping and highlighting that quite a bit in policy circles at the beginning of this, trying to say, let's not let that happen again. Um, and we're continuing to do that. But I, I think, you know, I was really sympathetic, more sympathetic to kind of the choices policymakers had to make earlier on, and particularly when there's scarcity, when we had no idea which vac how many vaccines will be available in 2021. You know, um, what we saw is rich countries, countries with the ability to purchase a lot of vaccines, way more than they need, um, they hedged their bets. They, they purchased every vaccine under the moon that they could, that, promising vaccine. Some, some of them haven't even come to fruition. Some of them didn't work, um, but many of them did. And I think what we really saw, the transition went from hedging bets, which we were, we didn't love, but we were sympathetic to because nobody knew if one of those would work or 10 of those would work, um, to kind of hedging to hoarding is essentially what we saw. Um, because when all of those contracts start paying off, these are legally binding contracts where the vaccines are going to go to a handful of buyers, full stop. So now we're in this position where we're trying to correct for that. So I don't think it, it doesn't, it doesn't start with ill will necessarily. And this is where I think we need to have some kind of global norms that can kind of help deal with this. Um, there was a mechanism called COVAX that was set up at the very beginning of this pandemic, kind of trying, building the train while it was on the tracks kind of situation where they were trying to kind of create a, a global buying club, essentially, where um, different countries can kind of pay in, hedge their bets, and when one or two or three vaccines become uh, viable, available, they'll kind of dole them out in an equitable way with the goal of vaccinating 20% of the population in all countries that are participating. Now, that was back when we thought vaccinating 20% of the population in all countries was like a pipe dream. Um, and what we saw is that you know, the countries that were able to join COVAX could also sign their own contracts for vaccines and indeed got to the front of the line before COVAX. And COVAX is all over the news right now and they're getting beat up. And I think there's validity to some of the criticism, but there's a lot of, it was undermined every step of the way. So I don't want this to be a debate on whether or not COVAX or whatever international mechanism we have is the right one. We need to look at why did it fail? How can we tweak that? Um, and how can we kind of prompt better behavior, if you will? Um, because I, I wasn't pushing back on the Biden administration or the Trump administration who signed a lot of those contracts from doing it. They're looking up for Americans and that is their job. However, it can be done in a way that doesn't undermine other countries and continue to undermine them year, month after month, years into the future as it's doing right now. So we need to kind of figure that out. And that's some of the things that, um, some of the policies that we're grappling with right now in my job at one, uh, with the US government, with the EU, with the UK, with with the AU um, and trying to figure out, can there be safeguards built in the system that help promote a more equitable response in the future? All right, um, Jamie, selfishly, I have a question of my own for you. Um, I really want you to take part in this um, partly because of your activism as a Christian and particularly with the disaster ministry handbook, which you co-wrote in which you're providing guidance to ministries about how do they minister, how do they support their communities in these kinds of types of crisis. Um, we have many communities of faith here in Moscow, um, and I would love to hear what your thoughts are vis-a-vis -vis to them, our communities of faith, about this pandemic. You know, the phrase my mom uses is, is God sends a wake-up call. Is this a wake-up call of some kind? Do you see a message here? Um, just really curious for your perspective on it. Sure. You know, um, one of the ways that I've kind of thought about our response to COVID-19 um, as a psychologist is that in some ways it's been a little bit like the ink block test that we use as psychologists or the Rorschach test, where people are kind of projecting, you know, who they are onto what is seen and how they're going to react. And I think when you apply this to the religious community, that it tells us that there's a lot of fracturing across different faiths and how they're responding to this. You know, so for example, you know, you mentioned, you know, as a person of faith myself, and specifically coming from an evangelical background, that there's been a lot of discourse and a lot of disagreement about how to think about and respond to the vaccine in particular. You know, what was really interesting to me is, um, so our team, we actually announced the same day that the pandemic was declared a pandemic, we released our first manual on helping houses of worship prepare for COVID-19 and what was coming. We had also had like our very first article come out on that day, kind of 
you know, kind of ringing the bell to faith communities. And we also announced that we were going to start um, a web, a weekly webinar series. And we had no, no idea how long it would last, but that we were going to jump into the space and help communities of faith navigate what was ahead. And the reception was very positive. But as I mentioned, then with the vaccine, things started becoming much more um, politicized. And you started to see this intersection between, you know, our ideologies that people have in terms of their beliefs with politics. And that there's been this unhealthy nationalism between the two that I believe that has occurred that has been fueling some of the um, division that we're seeing in the U.S. among faith communities. And specifically, one of the things that we know from a couple of studies that we've done, like we were, as I mentioned in the opening, our team wanted to understand what drives one person to view Ebola as a national security threat or to view their neighbor as a national security threat or even have higher levels of prejudice towards them who are different than themselves. And we did the same thing at the height of um, during the last political election excuse me, not this one, but the last one, to understand the Syrian refugee crisis. And we found two factors that cut across even more deeply than just political affiliation when we controlled for that in these national samples. So again, both in the Ebola outbreak as well as the Syrian refugee crisis. And, and what we found, the two biggest predictors, one was cultural humility and the other was the type of religiosity a person expressed. So by cultural humility, we found those that were more open to viewing and wanting to learn and uh, more accepting of other people's culture, that that actually was one of the biggest predictors for them being welcoming of others that were different than themselves. The other major factor was the type of religiosity. So by that meaning that you could have two people that have the same commitment, maybe they even go to the same house of worship, but that one, that they go for more external reasons, that I'm a pharmacist, it's good for my business to go to church because that's going to get me referrals versus intrinsic religiosity, which is more of kind of an, um, an interpersonal uh, search for meaning and something larger than yourself. And, and so what we found was that those individuals that have higher levels of extrinsic religiosity or kind of more external um, expressions of faith, that they're more likely statistically to view their neighbors with suspicion um, and to have higher levels of prejudice. And so I think we're seeing some of that also playing out and why politics has taken such a strong hold because it's more tied to that external reasons for being religious than intrinsic or internal reasons. Wow, interesting. Um, this one is probably gonna be fielded by Dr. Reich, um, but we have a comment here in the Q&A. I try to make a conscious effort, uh, this attendee says, to not use metaphors of war when talking about health and public health. How do we elevate the urgency of the threat um, without using this type of language with the public? Well, that's a great question. It's one that haunts me a lot um, as a former military person, someone still still working for the federal government. Again, I'm the president of the Joint Special Operations University, right? So I'm, I'm still squarely involved in this. Um, it's a haunt uh, because as when I was uniformed as a warrior, I saw myself based, I defined my, my role as a public servant more in the political object as you know, you know, the military theorists would call it the political objective, the purpose, not the day to day task. And the purpose of of the instrument of war and warfare is to find and arrive at a relative peace as we can come to know it. So, you know, my, my whole time in uniform, it was really I, I'm an, I was I was an instrument of of the national state. My tasks were prepare for war fighting, but to do so in a way that hopefully avoids ever having to use the instrument. It's like maybe why a, a surgeon becomes a surgeon, um, to be prepared if and when the time for surgery comes, that there's a surgeon skilled to do so. But to be a surgeon ecstatic about the opportunity to cut into the, the, the patient, I mean, that, that's an abomination, similarly with the military. So um, that's a roundabout way of saying, I, I agree with the person, um, with the, with the uh, questioner, um, in their question and their concern. Um, not, only, not only would I prefer us being able to get away from the war rhetoric, I'd love for us to be able to get away from the imperatives that we place on war and warfare and war fighting in, in particular. The rhetoric, the, the trap of the war rhetoric and why it's so powerful is because of the, the degree to which we as human beings and perhaps, perhaps the West 
the so-called West more pointedly and perhaps more even more pointedly, the United States of America, um, the investment that we put into that particular instrument of national effect. Uh, so I think long, long story, not so short, the way we get out of the rhetoric is to get out of the practice or to at least work to putting ourselves out of business. And the way to do that is to get at root causes and the investments in human security from a United States standpoint, and maybe relating back to um, COVID-19, we've got to begin to see even, even sellable in a self-centered, selfish way. In order for me to help me and mine as Americans, I've got to make sure that all the Petri dishes worldwide are dissolved so that there's no opportunity for a, a Lambda or a Mu variant that defies all treatments comes back and hurts me and mine. You can arrive at the right answers, even in the utilizing the most self-centered, selfish reasons. And I, unfortunately, as part of the, the, it's one of the paradoxes of this compounding nature of all things, particularly security, security threats and security affairs. But um, I, I think the way out of the war rhetoric is for us to, to lay down the, you know, as, as President Eisenhower put it, right? You know, convert, convert the war material back to plowshares. Uh, I, I'm a, I'm a big, believe, big believer in that At, when I was a uniform, when I was a soldier once and young, and I remain so as a citizen of the world. If I can just add to that quickly, I, I also struggle with the war rhetoric because it's, it's tempting to use because it's a, it is a, an analogy, like it works, um, but super sensitive to everything that comes with that. And we tend not to use it for that reason. I think if you just start, the reason we use it is because we where in my job are looking at investments. What are we investing in? Um, what are we building through those investments? And so I think without even talking about war, I mean, it's if you look at the United States budget, it speaks for itself um, in terms of where we're putting financing. And, and I think, you know, but if you look at me as an individual or my family, um, what kind of investments do I want our country or our community be made in my daughter and myself? And it's not that I don't want a national security, I do, but on the whole, the pie chart would look different. Um, and so I think I think thinking about that and the individual level impact and what we're investing in, the human capital that we're investing in um, is a way to kind of talk about that, that will, you know, the outcome of that is probably shifting funding away from or, or investing differently um, in our health systems and our global health and our international partners, um, as well as national security. It's not a zero sum game, but it, it, there could be, there could be a, completely different way that we look at this and prioritize it within the context of the United States budget, which is really where the rubber hits the road. And if I could just add to kind of um, providing, you know, so if we think about those policy com conversations that we have, and I think in addition to those, it's also going to be helpful for us to think about what are those interpersonal conversations that we're having with one another. So kind of tying that back to the war rhetoric that I think we're going to see more change through friendships than fighting. Um, so I do think you're all right that, you know, move, being able to move away from some of that war language will be useful. We, we did a study where we took people that we knew had very strong religious beliefs and um, that they were completely in disagreement with one another. And so we would take these really hot button topics that would oftentimes create a lot of anger in people that they were very passionate. We put them in a small room together and then said, okay, talk about this. Um, you know, so we were intentionally setting the stage for conflict to happen. And, and what we found at the end of the day was that when somebody perceived the other person as being more humble, that that other person listened to them, that they were trying to perspective shift, that even if they disagreed with them, they were more likely to view that person as being more trustworthy and were actually more likely to change their minds. But the people that just came in at it as a fight from the get-go, that there was no change that happened there. So I, I think that we need to learn how to have these humble conversations with one another as well. As my mom would say, something about the pride and fall, something about that. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have um, just about 10 minutes to wrap up, Sean Manuel, if you'd like to maybe go around the table if you have a final provocation to give each person and then if you have any closing remarks of your own. Sure. Um, well, I, I was sitting here listening to the discussion about war language with a feeling a little guilty because in my book, Victory Deferred, um, of course, the title <laughs> and, and the, the chapter titles within the book are very um, much taken from warfare. And I talk about soldiers and 
the making of soldiers. But I, I had actually taken my cue and took the title of the book from a poem of Walt Whitman's in which he says that, um, don't you know that the theme, the ever enduring theme of every bard in history is war and the making of war. And I think that on a, on a personal level, um, it can be helpful to, to think in, in those terms. I, I see absolutely where it's not helpful at all on a policy, political, you know, sort of public level. But, um, you know, part of, part of my cue again was uh, St. Paul, who said the last enemy that shall be conquered is death. You know, so even, even St. Paul framed life in terms of, you know, struggle for life and death, and that death was the final enemy, and that HIV, and in this case, uh, SARS-CoV-2, is, is the enemy, you know, the faceless microbial enemy. Um, and I think that in a certain level, you know, we are physical creatures, and, and it's hard to conceptualize a faceless microbial enemy, an enemy we can't see, but we can understand um, metaphor and, and language that we use to describe things that are our enemies. And, and I think that language can be useful, but um, with caveats that you all have articulated really well. <laughs> um, so, well, let's see, we, we've had quite a, quite a terrific discussion here. And um, I like how we three, you three, and, and me um, sort of, you know, randomly pulled together, uh, had a really great conversation that, that sort of segued into one another. Um, I'm just curious if any of you, maybe all of you, each of you has kind of a closing thought after our discussion, maybe something that you've heard from the others on the panel that sparked you to think differently than maybe you did when we started. Um, Jenny, could we, could we start with you? Sure. Um, I think kind of in a line, the United States national response to COVID-19 has to be a global response. Um, and that goes for COVID-19 or any other pandemic threat that we face in the future. And I hope that that mindset can sink in. It does not come at the expense of Americans and it bolsters the protection that we're giving America by ensuring that we're stopping the spread of the virus everywhere. And I think, um, Dr. Ike said it really well a few minutes ago. There's a self-interest case to be made here. And this is a little different for us. Like generally I think global health and when I'm advocating for global health and investments in global health and fighting AIDS or whatever it might be, childhood preventable diseases, it's often looked at through the lens of charity. Um, and I think in some ways it can kind of work because we're so often talking about like threats that are raging elsewhere and less so in America. Um, this, was a, this is a wake up call in that we know, global health professionals know that it is in the self-interest of America or other rich countries to kind of tamp down these threats everywhere. Um, but the investments are looked at as more of a charity thing. We have to reverse that. Um, their viruses don't respect borders. There will be more. Um, we need to look at this as a health security kind of complex. And um, I really, really hope that our that kind of the politics and the mistrust and misinformation, I mean, those are gonna be the threats that we're facing. I don't know the answers to those. I mean, that is that is where we need all the brilliant bright minds and schools today to come help us please. Um, because we, um, I think our global health systems, we know what to do in global health. What I don't know what to grapple with and what one of the questions actually asked when we talk about hesitancy and other things with that, that really resulted in the bad health outcomes we saw in America. It wasn't because we have the weakest health system. Some of, I mean, our health systems were pondered pretty well. And when it came down to it, when vaccines arrived, we got them in a lot of people's arms. What we did not account for is politics, misinformation, mistrust. We have to figure out new and creative ways to overcome those challenges. Um, both in the United States and globally, if we're going to be able to address crises like these in the future. Let's see, Jamie, would you mind going next, since you were kind of last first? <laughs> yeah, you know, just reflecting on our conversation this evening, 
and the great insights that everybody had shared, you know, I think it just shows that this is such a complex issue and that there's not just one solution and that each of us, everyone has a role to play in stamping out COVID-19 that, you know, in our own relationships and our communities, but also that this is a political issue, there's systems issues, this is a global issue, that this is something that really is going to take everyone, you know, doing their part of what they can uh, to be able to start to curb this impact. Dr. Ike. Great. I, I just want to thank everyone in the Bohr Foundation right off the bat for this phenomenal opportunity. Um, I hope now that we all know each other, I'm looking forward to us maybe staying in contact because um, for personal, professional reasons, but also, I mean, I think it begins here. I'd, I'd start my closing comments with that. Um, it's, it's, you know, I hate to say this, but I will. It takes, it's gonna take a really huge village, a community-wide, a global village to solve these problems. You know, in the military, we apply what we call a joint interagency task forces. Right. And we bring in all members of a lot of different sectors to deal with what are problems and opportunities that lie at the nexus of different stovepipes, whether it's the intelligence community, the military services themselves, FBI, trade, commerce, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing, compound security threats demand demand. It's not a nice to do, nice to have. It demands nothing less than equal if not overmatching compound approaches, treatments, in order to arrive at cures. Not just treatments to the acute problems, but um, healing of the chronic, the chronic disease in the, in the diseases, and those lie at root causes. It takes a preventative health approach, whether you're talking about traditional war in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, um, Syria, Yemen, et cetera, frankly, right here at home, um, or whether you're dealing with a, with a um, biological threat like a, like a global pandemic. Uh, I, I wanna end just with, uh, you know, I'm, I'm once again haunted by this war's rhetoric and the utility of it. Uh, so I wanna thank the person who questioned, I'm not gonna get any sleep again tonight. I just started getting, you know, being able to sleep and now, now I'm haunted again. Uh, I wanna go back to Dave's opening, you know, and the beauty of this, of this um, foundation in this, in this um, symposium um, in Eleanor Roosevelt's first keynote, right? The causes of war and conditions of peace. Or I would say the, the making of wars, whether man-made or, or natural, the making of wars begins with our failure to secure the communitarian peace. And that begins at the human dimension, communitarian at the, at the root level. That's where the politics also resides. So eliminating Seydoux gaps between our ideals, our principles, our founding documents, what we say we believe in, but have long been chronically triggered to poorly and anemically invest to eliminate the say do gaps. We just have to get better at that because if we don't, we're gonna create um, an extension, an extension, an extinction level event at, at the at the at the human at the human level. I mean again, COVID-19 is has no agency. But we look at all the agencies that we've placed to it in terms of have versus have nots, um, the natural tendency to go into the fetal position, metaphorically, self-help, redefine and simplify the threat to me and mine, right? It's relative gains, zero, zero sum calculations. I've got to get mine at the expense of other. That, that is the exact opposite of the things we have to do always, but in particularly in this new age of compound, compounding of all things, particularly in the security and defense realm. Um, the threats themselves are telling us what we need to do to get back to our, to the foundations of who we are as human beings on the planet. Um, and, you know, we're talking about a pandemic, but, you know, right around the corner is goal, you know, global chain, all these factors, both probably ourselves. We rise up from that and from whatever drive ourselves back um, to a better place to over overmatch these compoundings. I don't know if uh, Dr. Ike dropped. Um, his connection was a little choppy. 
Jean Manuel, if you want to sort of finish things off with a closing statement, I kind of liked uh, Dr. Ike's notion of like, what is, what is this thing telling us, right? What, what's the wake up call? What's the message? What is this thing um, telling us here? Right. What, what is this telling us? And, and I would say, I would guess that we take our own lessons from it. Um, just as we bring our own meanings to it, you know, the virus has no agency. We has no meaning in and of itself. Um, it's just a biological phenomenon and human beings attach meaning and significance to it. Um, I thought what I would do is, you know, I took a few notes on each of the panelists comments and I would just summarize by, by taking a couple things from them. Um, Jenny made it clear that we, we have the tools to stop the pandemic, but the choice is really up to us individually, you know, communally, our government, the world, um, what we're going to do with that. Uh, Dr. Ike, Dr. Wilson talked about uh, compounded security that, that we've done too little too late. He also said it's an interesting time um, that we are living in because we do have the opportunity to um, think from our experience with COVID, how we will be prepared for the next global pandemic or the next glo global humanitarian catastrophe that unfolds. And we, we know from history and we know from our own lives that uh, one and more inevitably will. Um, and finally, Dr. Atten, you know, talked about complex emergencies and how when one disaster happens, it tends to lead to other disasters. When someone is <clears throat> diagnosed or hospitalized with COVID, um, it leads to other emergencies within their family. Um, who's going to take care of the kids? Who's going to, you know, do this? It, it, it's not just a health incident of one person, but it's the ripples um, outward to our social um, collectives, from our family to our community, to our larger society and our country, um, and ultimately the human race. So we have the, the tools we need. We have the choice what we'll do with them. Um, it's an interesting time. We've done too little too late, but I'm with Jenny and, and I think all of us that we remain hopeful and optimistic for our future um, because human beings do have the capacity to evolve and improve ourselves. Um, and I'd just like to thank the University of Idaho and the Boris Symposium for hosting this. It was a really, really interesting discussion. I'm very glad to have been part of it. Jean Manuel, thank you so much as a moderator and to Jenny, Jamie and Ike, as I see you in the grid there. Thank you so much um, for participating in, the, in this conversation and bringing these uh, unique perspectives together, uh, public and private. Um, so yeah, just a quick reminder, right? Tomorrow at 1230, we have a virtual presentation that's social change and the 14th century plague pandemic. So sort of relating Black Plague times to now. That'll be Scott Minich, who's a professor here at U of I. You do need to pre-register for that. So uidaho.edu slash Bora will have the links for that. And then we have our keynote, which is 7 p.m. at Wednesday. That will be in person, if you're available to be in person, in the International Ballroom at the Pittman Center. The speaker is Michael Osterholm, who's a COVID-19 expert and director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. That does not require a pre-registration, uh, pre but if you go to uidaho.edu slash Bora, you can watch that virtually if you're not gonna be joining us at Pittman. So I think that's all we have for today. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and enjoy the rest of the symposium events. Thank you. Take care.